We are honored to be in another man's pulpit. I bring greetings from my wife, Lori. She and I have been dating 54 years and married 50 years, and 45 of those were happy. And um, we have six children. We had seen that statistically one out of seven babies born today are Chinese, and so we quit at six. We didn't want to risk that. And uh, really, you just... Uh... I laugh about a lot of things, but I never, never, never laugh about the things of God, heaven and hell, eternity, and the Bible. And every time I get to a church, kind of for a first time, I give my personal testimony. I believe how you got saved and what God does in your life is just as important as mine, but it's my turn to talk. It ends up that it's the same God and the same Bible and the same Holy Spirit, but just worked out in a different life. And so as we will get to 2 Corinthians chapter five, that's in the New Testament, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, but let me just put a little frame around the picture before we get into the text. Born and raised on a dairy farm in Wisconsin that's been in our family since 1847, and I still live there. My twin brother and I run the farm, but in more recent years we lease out the land, but we were dairy farmers. We milked cows every day, and Our family did not go to church. My mother was born and raised in a Polish family. She had a sister who was a nun, a brother who was a priest, and devout Roman Catholics. Her parents never spoke English. They came to this country and raised a Catholic family. But she, at 18, met my father, who you can tell was ragingly handsome. So they marry and they kicked her out of the Roman Catholic Church immediately. Those years, while you're anathema maranatha, you married a non Catholic and that's it. Great disappointment to her parents. And so she was a disenfranchised Roman Catholic. My dad's family were nominal Methodists. They said they were Methodists, but really in name only, we never, ever went to church. No, we weren't stupid. We were a hardworking family. We were successful. But, you know, you can be smart and successful, but be ignorant of Bible truth. And I'm telling you that I didn't know the Virgin Mary from Aunt Jemima. Just, if you don't know, you don't know, you don't know. And... My senior year of high school, there was a new blonde girl on the school bus. Now, I wasn't saved, but I wasn't blind. (laughs) And I asked her out, and she said, I can't go out with you, but would you come to church with me? And I went to a Baptist church. Now, listen to me. If you've never been in church and you get invited to church, you don't don't know what to expect. And I go to this Baptist church on a Sunday night, and there's maybe 20, 25 people there total. It's a 110-year-old building that had broken out stained glass windows mostly elderly people, I think one set of teeth in the congregation total. <laughs> and we stand to sing the first song. Now hear me, I don't, I don't, I don't know the songs, I don't, I, I, never, I don't even know what we're doing. But we stand to sing the first song and the woman in front of me takes a songbook and puts it on her head like this. Now look, if you've never been in church. (laughs) 
I, I, look, I have no idea. But I'm looking around and wonder what have I gotten into here? And this horrible thought hit me. I wonder if the girl who invited me has a book on her head. (laughs) And I sat down and sure enough, there she has a book on her head. So I broached the subject. I mean, hey, I don't don't know. Uh, What's with the book on the head? And she says, oh, at night the bats come out. And us girls don't want the bats in our hair, so we just put a book on our head so that they don't get in our hair. In the morning service, pigeons fly in here, but the bats don't come out in the morning service. My first day in a Baptist church. Now, my opinion hasn't changed much since then. But the pastor preached the gospel and said, you need to be saved. Now, right, all of this is new. After church, he asked, are you saved? No, I wasn't saved, but doesn't it sound like the kind of club you'd want to belong to? (laughs) So I said, yes. But I wasn't ready for the second question. He said, when did you get saved? Now, up until that moment, I had only one religious experience in my existence. We didn't go to church, I didn't go to catechism, youth camp, anything like that, we were farmers. But when I was 16 years old, our family was in the living room. We've gotta go milk cows yet, but we always had supper before we went out. And my mom was in the kitchen fixing supper And we were in the living room watching, well, we had an educational program, kind of a scientific thing. You didn't get it up here in in Canada, I'm sure, but it was Gilligan's Island. (laughs) And they had like a professor on there and, and everything. And we're sitting there watching Gilligan's Island. And my mom stepped in the living room and said, supper's on the table. But then her eyes rolled back in her head and she began to have seizures and she convulsed and vomited all over herself and fell to the floor right there in front of dad and all of us kids. And she seizured and seizured. We call the ambulance, but when you live where we live, that's 45 minutes away. Picked her up and carried her to the bed in the downstairs. She continued to seizure. None of us ate supper. My brothers went out to milk the cows. My dad and I waited. When the ambulance came, we followed it into the hospital. They ran tests. At 11 o'clock at night, the doctor came and saw us and said, She's had a massive brain aneurysm. It's just exploded in her head and the pressure on her brain has been so severe and so long that if she lives at all, she'll be a vegetable. Now listen, nobody had called my mother a vegetable. The most helpless, life-changing, circumstance. And then he said, she's liable to pass tonight. Now hear me, when when you're just lost as a goose in a snowstorm and you don't know anything, I wandered the halls of the hospital and I came by a door that said chapel. And I went in and there I prayed and I said, God, please, Let my mother live. I'm no different than you, right? I'm saying, 16, I I don't want my mommy to die. But it was the only time I'd ever prayed anything. But those of you that are here and that are truly Christian, you understand praying for your mother to live is not the same as salvation. 
And at four o'clock the very next morning, less than 12 hours after she collapsed, my mother, while we cried and held her hand, shuddered and breathed her last breath and went off into eternity. When they said, none of us has a promise of tomorrow, you could be standing before God. I believe that real quick. I had that down cold. So the pastor says, when did you get saved? And I said, well, I, I prayed the night my mother died, which was a true statement. I did pray the night my mother died. They were patient with me. I went to church, I heard the gospel on and off, wanted to see the girl, and they were friendly people in the Baptist church, and so I would go on and off. And One Sunday night, December of 1969, the pastor preached and he said, you could fool other people about whether or not you're truly saved. And you might be able to fool yourself but you will never fool God. He knows what you're trusting in your heart of hearts to take you to heaven. And that was just like a dagger, dagger, dagger into my heart. What difference does it make if I fool this handful of people? Someday, I'm gonna stand before God Almighty. And that night in the middle of December 1969, I said to the pastor after church, listen, I'm not really saved, but I do want to get it settled. I had heard enough church services. I knew the enough Bible. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And a very sincere 18-year-old young man said, Lord, please forgive me. Save me. Take me to heaven. They didn't have to tell me twice I was a sinner. I hit that part down. But I got saved and I meant it, and he took me as I was and forgave me and saved my soul. Well, the pastor says, you know, after you're saved, you want to get baptized. And so I said, okay, I'll get baptized. And, right, I'm not against any of this. I, I'm, I'm fine. And so I say to my friends, I'm in college now for mechanical engineering, and I say to my schoolmates, hey, you guys, why don't you come see me get baptized? Second week of January, I'm going to get baptized in deep water in a Baptist church. Why don't you come? And they all said, well, why? we don't want to go there. We're not Baptists. We don't go to a Baptist church. No, we're not coming. And I said, hey, guys, look. Come and watch me get baptized, and then I'll take you to the tavern, and I'll buy a round of beers, and we can celebrate me getting baptized. If you don't know, you don't know. Right? I'm saying, hey. This is all new to me. Here's the miracle. The week before Christmas on a Wednesday night at a prayer meeting, I raised my hand. Yes, Randy. Uh, listen, pray. I got four friends coming. They're going to come watch me get baptized. Then we're going to go to the tavern and hoist a few beers. And if any of you want to come, you can come. I'll buy for you too. <laughs> the miracle is the pastor kept a straight face. <laughs> If you don't know, you just don't know. I, now hear me, I know this is stupid, but as far as I knew, the people in that building were the only Christians on the planet. I'd never watched Billy Graham. I'd never been to another church. I'd never been anywhere. And so Good Friday of 1970, the pastor says, we're gonna take a bus, and all you young people, you're gonna go to a youth rally, a regional youth rally. Well, fine. If she's going, I'm going. We get on the bus, we drive to Milwaukee, and I walk into a building not unlike this. There's 500 teenagers. There's a 70 voice choir. They're singing songs from their toenails, just happy as a clam. They're doing skits, everybody's, and there's instruments playing. Look, I, did, I hadn't seen anything like this. I'm sitting back there on that side and I'm watching like, look at this. And then the pastor strode to the platform and said, I want you to turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. I'm going to show you five reasons to stay faithful to Jesus Christ. 
He said, the average Christian only zealously serves the Lord for four or five years, and then they kind of slip it in the weeds and coast the rest of the way. Now hear me, I'm three months old in the Lord. This is the greatest thing that ever happened. My sins are forgiven. I'm on the way to heaven. I have a purpose for living. I know what I'm doing here. This is going to be life altering. And I didn't just take on a new hobby. This isn't just gunsmithing or snowshoeing or leather crafting. This isn't something I'm trying on for size. I meant this. How could anybody quit? What, what, what are you talking about? I really believed he was lying. I'm just saying, you gotta understand, when you're a brand new Christian, you have no idea. I've come to find out he was probably more right than wrong. But he said, I'm gonna show you five reasons to stay true to Christ and just in the big picture, let me say, when he was done, a very sincere young man, never had done it before, but I stepped out of a pew and went forward and knelt at an altar and I said, God, please, I don't want to be a casualty. I don't want to be a washout. I don't want to be a quitter. You're everything to me and I want to stay true to you. By your spirit, through your scriptures, would you help me to stay faithful to you? I know me. I'm going to need help with this. God, would you help me? I prayed that. Good Friday, 1970, what is that, almost 200 years ago. <laughs> and I haven't been everything I wanna be, but God's been mighty, mighty good to hear the prayers of a sincere young man, and he's been faithful to me. And so today, I'm challenging you just from these same five verses. It's not new with me, but the Bible's still just as true as it was back then. And so let's look at five verses. There's way more than that in this chapter. Paul's writing to the church at Corinth and lots of things going on, but this is to the Christians. And so I'm going to ask you to just quietly stand with me as we read the first verse, number 10. 2 Corinthians 5 and verse number 10, would you read it out loud together with me, beginning? For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that every one may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Let's pray. Lord, bless our time in the scriptures. Lord, would you do an unusual thing here today? Speak to each heart. Some young person, a dear lady, a discouraged Christian, and would you somehow galvanize their conviction, give them grace and strength and perception and commitment and courage and Lord, I pray you'd help them to finish well. They're here now. They're facing the right direction. They're hearing the word of God. If there's one among us that's not saved, I pray that they get that truly settled. It doesn't matter. They can go year after year after year fooling people. I pray you'd help them to genuinely get it settled between you and them before it's eternally too late. For those that are Christian, I pray you'd put your arms around this congregation and Lord, my prayer would be each one in the sound of my voice under the preaching of this scripture would stay true to you until you come for us or until they pass from this life do an unusual, miraculous moving of your Holy Spirit in each one, I pray in Jesus' name. 
Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. He said, I'm going to show you the five reasons that God has helped me to stay true. The Bible is the sword of the Spirit. The Holy Spirit applies it to my life. And he read verse number 10. He said, someday we're going to stand before God. It's not going to be group therapy. You don't get to hide behind somebody else. There's going to be no comparing. You can't say, oh, I'm not, I'm not Billy Graham or Mother Teresa, but I'm, I'm sure not Adolf Hitler and I'm a pretty decent. None of that. God knows all deeds and he knows all motives. He knows your uprisings and your down sittings. He knows you better than yourself. He knows what you do and why you're doing it. You're going to answer to a holy God. The Bible says it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a living God. You've never faced anybody who knew the absolute truth about you. And he said that day, he says, you know, the thought that I'm going to stand there before a holy God who knows the absolute truth about me is a very fearsome thing. But the hope that I'm going to receive the things done in my body and I'll be rewarded for what I do for good and for God. That wonderful promise, that firm assurance that, hey, I don't have to live in fear and dread of that moment. I can do for God what I ought to be doing and obey the Bible and I can look forward to being rewarded at that time and I don't have to dread that moment. And he said, the thought that I'm going to answer to God keeps me faithful and true to Jesus Christ. And then he moved on to verse number 11. There it says, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men, but we are made manifest unto God, and I trust also made manifest in your consciences. And he said, there is a real hell. And people really go there. And then he cited, send Lazarus to dip his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I'm tormented in this flame, in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and the glory of his power from 1 Thessalonians. Where the worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched, the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever and ever. People, when they die outside of Christ, are cast into hell and ultimately the lake of fire. And if I can do anything to prevent that. If I can do anything to rescue somebody, I can't do anything about my mommy, she's gone. But I might be able to help somebody else's mommy. I might be able to give the gospel to someone else. If you had one ounce of the milk of human kindness, if you had one shred of spiritual maturity, you'd say, I don't want anybody to go to hell. Nobody's hurt me that bad that I would want to resign them to hell. Broad is the way that leads to destruction, and many there be that good in their For straight is the gate, and narrow is the way that leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. Dr. Reber said that day, and I never forgot, hey, hey, if nothing else. Remember, it's the Vietnam era, 1969, 1970. All the flower children, all the tie-dyed t-shirts, the bell-bottom pants, the long stringy hair, the shag carpet and the tulip pictures on the Volkswagen vans and the anti-establishment. What is life all about? What's true love? What came first, the chicken or the egg? You don't know what a blessing it was to have a Bible that says, it was the chicken, the chicken. I, uh, I know what I'm doing here. I'm here to glorify God. I, I have the answers to all the big, complex, deep questions. But there's a hell. And no amount of shenanigans or spiritual gymnastics or misinterpretation or lying is going to change it. Liberal pastors 
unbelieving professors, it doesn't matter. They can say whatever they want, but someday that Bible verse is going to be proven. We know the terror of the Lord. Read Ezekiel 3. Read Ezekiel 33. How dare you have the truth and not warn those around you? He'll die in his sins, but his blood I'm going to require at your hands. You knew the truth. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. And he preached for a few minutes on the horrors of hell and that the most damnable thing about it, you can, you can endure almost anything if there's going to be an end to it. Hey, I'm, I'm going through this disease, but hopefully the boils will go away. Hey, I, I had my arm amputated, but someday I'll get a new arm. There's something about the hope that this is only temporary. Even people with terminal cancer, hey, this can only last until I pass, and then I'm going to be off in eternity. But hell... The lake of fire is forever and ever and ever. And some of the worst part about it is the hopelessness and the certain knowledge that it will never end. There is no chance. We know the terror of the Lord. And so we persuade men. He says, while I'm here, I'm committed to trying rescuing people from the horrors of hell. And then he went to verse 14. And there we read, for the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. And he talked about the wonders of the love of God. How Christ was the lamb slain from before the foundation of the world. We're not an afterthought. We're not a second option. God always had in mind the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts. He had in mind to forgive mankind. He had in mind to save mankind. And he could send his only begotten son and he hung there on the cross and he died there. Don't you want people to know about the Rose of Sharon, the lily of the valley, the lover of your soul, the one that could know the worst truth about you and love you anyway? He could save to the uttermost all who come unto God by him. Nobody's outside the sphere of the love of God. And the Bible says, the love of God constraineth us. It's like you, you grab and say, someone and say, come here, come here, I just gotta show you this. The innocent dying for the guilty. He's willing to pass you from death unto life. He's hanging there on the cross between a holy God and a sinful planet and he cries out, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And he shed his lifeblood on the cross of Calvary and offered free and full forgiveness to everybody. And then he made a statement. He said, when someone knows of the love of Christ and turns their back on it, when someone hears of the possibility of forgiveness and rejects it, when someone learns of Jesus Christ, Father, forgive them, they know not what they do, and they reject it, it's as if they shove that cross over, they trample under feet the blood of that soil, and they say, that's not good enough for me. And when you reject the love of God, all that's left is the judgment of God. He is love. God is love. And God would rather show mercy than judgment. He's also holy. From his love proceeds long suffering and mercy and forgiveness. But from his holiness proceeds justice and judgment and equity. I've got written in the Bible, in front of my Bible, God shows mercy whenever he can. 
judgment only when he must. The book of James says mercy rejoices against judgment. He's not some big ogre up there with a hammer playing whack-a-mole, just can't wait to send people. No, why would you die, O Israel? He wept, not willing that any should perish. The love of God constrains us. Hear me, that's a compelling reason to stay true to Christ just because you want people to know the one who could forgive you. I'd like them to know him. They say never talk about hell without a tear in your eye. Never act like you're happy about it. You should want people to be saved and not lost. Verse 17, it says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature, old things are passed away, behold, all things are become new. And he talked about being a new creature in Christ. And he said, even if there was no judgment seat, even if there was no hell to shun, and even if there was no heaven to gain, I've lived a terrific life because I'm a new creature in Christ. I'm not on some search for significance to figure out if my life is valuable. I don't wonder what I'm supposed to be doing here. I was created for his pleasure. I have purpose. I have companionship. I have fellowship. I have joy. I have a peace that passes all understanding. I'm a new creature in Christ. I don't have to be the old man. I don't have to be. God put within me a Holy Spirit. I can now have the power to get victory over those things that plagued me. I love hearing it when someone says, hey, I was in prison and I went to a chapel service and I heard the gospel and I got saved. I was addicted to heroin and I got to the bottom and I nearly died and a chaplain came to the hospital and he showed me the gospel and I got saved. I love, hey, I was a falling down drunk and my wife divorced me and my kids weren't speaking to me and I was in a rescue mission and heard the gospel and I got saved. I love hearing how God can save people. But that wasn't me. I've never been drunk. I never did drugs. I never... I didn't have to be delivered from that. I was a sinner for sure. But when you're successful, handsome, popular, pride has a way of condemning souls, you know. And I just didn't like two people. I didn't like little kids. I don't like little kids. I like being around my peeps. I don't like little kids, the ankle biters, curtain climbers. And so when little kids came by me, I kicked them. It's the truth. I just kicked them. You'd be surprised how they don't come around. You kick them a couple times, and then they leave you alone. And then the other thing I didn't like was old people. They drool, they smell, they drive stupid, they say things that never happened. When old people would talk, I would just walk away, no problem, they can't catch me. (laughs) That's the truth, it's the truth. And I got saved. I was going to school for engineering, I was gonna make lots of money. Every one of my aunts and uncles is a millionaire. Our farm was a multi-million dollar farm. All of my siblings are millionaires. I'm going to school on a full ride scholarship for engineering and I'm gonna make lots of money and look down my nose at the peons. But I got saved. Found out that eternal values are way more important than temporal things. I got saved and wow, I'm seeking the Lord. I get to Peter, seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of person ought you to be in all manner of holy conversation? The only thing you can take to heaven with you is another soul. One week, the head of the engineering department takes me aside and says, Randy, 
you're doing well in school, and there's a company here in town that would like to hire you as a design engineer. Freshman in college, offer you a starting salary of 70,000 a year. Listen, that's pretty big money in 1970. That same week, my dad says, Randy, I think you're the son of all eight kids. I'd like you to have the farm. Could we go to the lawyer and sign the papers? In the same time, the pastor, our church had grown from 30 to 40. And when you have crowds, you need staff. And he said, would you be my assistant pastor? $25 a week. You know, if you can't give them a raise, give them a title. <laughs> but if pride is your problem, when somebody offers to make you the assistant pastor, you, know, you can strut sitting down if you've got that much pride. And so I prayed and I said, God, you're going to have to show me. Four in the morning... I rolled over in bed, opened my Bible before I went up to milk, before I drove to the university. And I said, God, you're gonna have to show me from the Bible. Now, if you do this, you're stupid. But I just opened my Bible and put my finger on a page. That's the truth, it's just the truth. God blesses ignorance. I'm glad it didn't land on Judas went out and hung himself. <laughs> but it said, James and John, the sons of Zebedee by the Sea of Galilee, immediately they left their father and their nets and followed him. That might not mean much to you, but that was... Listen, when you're 18, 19, 20 years old and trying to find the will of God and don't know any better than to just say, Lord, please show me through your word. And as far as I was concerned, it was like that was written to Randy King. My picture was right beside that verse. I went up to milk cows. I said, Dad, you're gonna have to give the farm to my brother. God doesn't want me to be a farmer. No, believe me, I'm... I'm for secular careers, but it just wasn't what God had in mind for me, you understand. I went to the university after calculus and computer programming and physics, economics. I meet with the head of the engineering department. I say, thank that company for their offer, but I'm going to pursue the ministry. I go Wednesday night to church and I say to the pastor, I don't know if you're going to want what you got, but you got what you wanted. Meet your new assistant pastor. You know what he said to me? That's terrific, Randy. I'd like you to be in charge of the youth and the nursing home. <laughs> no! No, 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 no! This is a case of mistaken identity. You said assistant pastor. We got a bus. It's a 1948 Chevrolet that came with rust from the factory. <laughs> I'm a farm kid. I was raised in a character disciplined home. I'm fresh off a bale and 80 pound baled hay. I'm driving this bus. I didn't know these juvenile delinquents existed. I got kids running across the bus seats while I'm up there driving greasy Grammy gopher guts they're singing and all this stuff. And I'm like frantic. But Jimmy, the ax murderer, I don't mean he was gonna grow up to be one. I think he had done it three or four times. Behind the back wheel on the right side, he stomps the rust out from behind there, and while I'm driving, out goes our jack, out goes the first aid kit, there goes the fire extinguisher, there goes the handle, there goes the flares. Now the reason I know about this is from the policeman who followed me into the church parking lot. <laughs> and he says to me in a little chat, 
hey, you know, while you were driving down Minnesota Street, you've got some kid who's been letting him down, self down through the hole in the bus, and then when you start going again, he pulls himself back up. And you're gonna have to run the route again. Ohio Street is where your jack is. And you're gonna have to go back, and I think it's a first aid kit that's there on Wisconsin Boulevard. And when he left, I picked up that little twerp. <laughs> 60 pounds of nothing. I put my thumbs on his Adam's apple. I could have popped his head off like a pimple. And he is kicking and flailing at me, and he says, you put me down, I'm gonna kill you. I said, you ain't gonna live long enough to kill me, you're dying here and now. <laughs> but you know how God is, and if you come to our church six weeks in a row and you're a young person, you get a Bible with your name stamped on the front of it. And I go to the home, 10 o'clock Saturday morning with a Bible for Jimmy and Linda and their other sister. And I open the door, they welcome me in and they, mom is drunk on the couch at 10 o'clock Saturday morning. They shake her awake and through beer bleary eyes, she says, well, what do you want? And I said, I'm here from the Baptist church and I have Bibles here for each of your children and thank you for letting them come. And she says, we're not Baptists. We go to the Catholic Church. They had been on my bus route and in our church six weeks in a row and mom never knew they were out of the house. Broke my heart. Not everybody was raised with the same advantages that I had. God put a love in my heart for those young people. I stayed driving bus and youth pastor for 17 years. We had over 70 teenagers that got saved, 17 couples that met and married, and are still part of our church today because somebody fell in love with little kids. I said to the pastor, rest home service. I, I've never been to a rest home. What do you do at a rest home service? He said, you just go there and preach. I said, preach what? He said, it doesn't matter. They're deaf. You're just practicing. <laughs> that, was my, that was my preparation for going to the rest home. I, I go there. It smells. I, I don't want to be there. I promise I don't want to be there. And don't you know that, if you've ever done rest home ministry, you know this is true. The very first time I opened the Bible and read a verse, and a woman over here says, dry up, why don't you dry up? You know you're boring us, you're just boring us. Why don't you just go home? I wanted to punt her over the moon. Things happen in a rest home you just can't fathom. A couple years after this, my wife and I had a little three-year-old girl, and old people in the rest home like to pet dogs and children, and so I, I take my daughter there, and she's sitting right up here, and there's a woman sitting in a wheelchair on the back row against the wall right next to a staff member, and she's saying, help me. Somebody help me, please, please, somebody help me. Please help me, help me, somebody. Now, when you're trying to preach, let me tell you, this bugs you. And the fact that the staff member is so obtuse or careless or so used to it that she's just sitting there, do something! Help me, somebody help me, please help me. And my little girl gets up and tugs in my pant leg and says, Dad, should I go help her? Yes, please, please, somebody go help her. This can't go on like this. She walks to the side, back to the, and walks toward the woman and says, can I help you? And the woman spits out her dentures 
and says, could you put these in a glass of water? And my daughter freaks out. She didn't know teeth could come out of your head. And I'm going, no, that did not just happen. She comes back, she's shell-shocked. And I'm going, oh, I know why I hate this place. But don't you know, there's a God. And it was only a week or two when there was a lady, kind of a rounder lady, and she'd had a stroke and she was paralyzed on one side, and so her arm was in a sling, and she didn't have movement in the whole one side, and so they had strapped her in the chair so that she wouldn't fall, tip out of the chair. And they brought her and put her in the front. She's just sitting right there. And you ladies know this is true. Some women are just elegant people. By their carriage, by their manner, by their bearing, by their hair, by the way they conduct themselves are just elegant people. And even in that kind of humbling circumstance, her hair was done right and she was smiling and pleasant and just kind of helpless. And she's there, black curly hair, and she had on a nighty And then she had a shawl wrapped around her. And when I said, turn in your songbook to page such and such, there she is with one hand trying to turn the pages on the book. And those of you that have been around the wheelchairs and nursing homes, a lot of time that tray is a very little tray. And her book started to slide off from that tray. I'm right here, I'm looking at it. And so she lunges to try to grab the book and the Afghan shawl type thing fell off onto the floor. And there she was, unclad except for that real thin little nighty sitting right there. The staff couldn't see it. But she took one look at me, the most mortified, humiliated, circumstance, but in that fragile moment, she looked forever like my mother. How would I want somebody to treat my mother? And God broke this old sinner's heart I fell in love with old people. I went down and picked up the afghan, tucked it in around her, and she mouthed, thank you, and changed this old sinner's heart forever. I fell in love with those old people. I did rest home services, two or three different rest homes, all the while I was youth pastor, all the while I was pastor. The last 11 years as I traveled, I did a rest home service a week ago. I love those old people. I have taken more women to the beauty parlor than you have. (laughs) I have knelt beside people that had a yellow puddle by their wheelchair more than you can imagine. I've walked out with a wet knee. I've done their funerals. I've notified their children. I have loved and helped and ministered to them my entire ministry. Now, Now, I am the old guy that drools and drives stupid and tells stories that never happened. (laughs) I hope somebody's patient with me when I'm in that circumstance. Hope somebody shows some respect to me. I hope that my life matters to somebody when I'm the one that doesn't have my full memory. Hear me, I'm a new creature in Jesus Christ. God has a hammer big enough for you. God has a way of making you conformed into his image. God can take anybody 
and with the help of the Holy Spirit, make you something that's a credit to Jesus Christ. I'm so glad Randy didn't, get need to, didn't need to get saved from drugs. Randy needed to get saved from Randy. Pride, arrogancy, achievement, success. None of that has eternal value. But investing in people, loving souls, portraying Christ, being patient, demonstrating Christian graces, does matter. Does matter. I'm a new creature in Christ. If there was no eternal reward at all, I've had an incredible, fantastic, delightful life. I put my head on a pillow at night and I don't wonder. Is what I did today important? I don't wonder. Did anybody catch me? I was on an airplane the other day and I was minding my business. Well, witnessing to the person next to me, that is my business. And sitting behind one row was a woman I didn't know or recognize, and she said, on the way off the plane, Pastor King, you don't know me, but I was at a church in Arkansas you preached at, and you preached on the love of Christ. And she said, here I see you 10 years later, and you're still sharing the love of Christ. Hear me. I'm not worried about being caught. I don't care where the cameras are. Hey, you do right and you have no fear over who's watching you. I'm a new creature in Christ, I got changed. I'm not perfect, but my wife's not here to testify. <laughs> Finally, verse 20 and we'll be done. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ did be reconciled to God. Brother Reber said that day, he, said, he was preaching to the young people, and he said, listen, listen. You have a divine mission, a divine purpose. You get to be in on God's holy crusade. You get to be on world evangelism. You get to give yourself to something that's way bigger than yourself. When you're a young person, and you don't know what the priorities are or what you're supposed to be doing for life. I was a farmer, and then I did engineering, and then I did home remodeling, and I ended up being a pastor. Don't be too hard on an 18-year-old. They don't always know where they're going to end up. Stand with them, support them, love them, help them. He said that day, he said, look, an ambassador, he leaves his home country and he goes someplace and he's in that foreign country and he comes out of the embassy and the clothes he wears, the people he meets, the way he conducts himself, the companions he has, his activities for the day are all being scrutinized. They're all being watched and they're wanting to see what are people like from that country. And he said, I get to represent a heavenly homeland and a heavenly king and how I conduct my affairs, how I treat people, where I go, what I do, my appearance, my character, my genuineness is a reflection of my home country. It's a reflection on the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. You have a high and holy calling. You get to reflect the light of Christ in a sin-darkened world. He wasn't talking about being a pastor, folks. He was talking about being a Christian. Now then, we're ambassadors for Christ as though God did beseech you by us. I get to speak on behalf of Jesus Christ. I get to be his hands while he's gone for right now. I get to spread his message while he's entrusted it to me. I get to be involved in the greatest crusade for souls that someday will be rewarded for. Nobody is ever going to get to heaven and regret what they did for God. You got a flesh that says do less for God. You have a devil that says do less for God. You got a world, no friend of grace, that says do less for God. And you got a Bible and a Holy Spirit and a pastor that says 
Let's do more for God. You know what's going to happen? We're going to stand before God someday, and nobody is going to say, oh, yeah, I did way too much. That preacher was all wet. Oh, yeah, no, I, wow, I should have coasted. Nobody is going to say that. They're going to say, thank God for a pastor, a church, Christian friends that exhorted me to do more for Jesus Christ. I get to be an ambassador for Jesus Christ. And at the end of the day, that's what's going to matter. I don't wonder, is what I'm doing important? Just, Lord, I'm not asking you to lighten the burden. I'm asking you to give me more grace. Give me the capacity to live for Christ. At the end of those five things, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Knowing, therefore, the terror of the Lord, the love of Christ constrains us. We're new creatures in Christ. We're ambassadors. He said sometimes it's one of the verses. Sometimes it's another thought. Sometimes it's all of them together. But he said God has used his word to keep me on track. That was, he was an adult man preaching in 1970 in March. I carried his picture in my Bible. I thanked God for that challenge. He just passed down in Tennessee. He pastored till he was 96 years old. These verses keep me faithful till Jesus Christ comes for me. Very sincere young man said, Lord, please help me. If left to myself, I dishonor you. I'm going to need your help. I know me. You think God could do that for you? I don't care how you got to this stage, and I don't care if you're 10, 20, or 80. Some of you look 100. From here till he comes for you, don't you want to stay true to him? From here till you pass from this life, don't you want to Stand before him and say, Lord, I did my best. And to hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant. I'd like heads bowed and eyes closed. God, I'm going to need help with this. Maybe you're here today and you've never been saved. Look, get it settled. I don't care how many false professions you've made. I don't care how many people you've fooled. I don't care how long it's been. If you're here and never truly been saved, you need to get that settled. You don't have a promise of tomorrow. I wonder who would say with the uplifted hand, Pastor King, I know that I know that I know I'm truly saved. I could tell you the time. I could take you to the place. I am a Christian. I settled it before today. And I'm mighty glad I did. Would you just slip your hand up and put it right back down, Pastor King? I know that I know that I know that I know. God bless you. God bless you. Many, many hands, perhaps all. I don't know. But maybe you're here, a young person or an adult, either one, and you'd say, Pastor King, I truly struggle with this. I'm not certain I've really gotten it settled. I sure don't want to die and go to hell. But I'm not really sure that I'm truly saved. Would you please pray for me? Would you just slip your hand up and put it right back down? I'm not sure. I'm really saved. I sure want to have it settled. I see two hands. Is there another? I'm not sure I'm saved, but I'd sure like to know. Is there another? Pastor King, between God and I, I'm not sure. Is there another? Maybe in the quietness of this moment, you'd like to just utter a prayer heavenward. Lord, please. I'm serious. I know this matters. Please save me. Please forgive me. Lord, take me to heaven when I die. I don't want to wrangle with this. I don't want to have this doubt, this nagging concern. I want peace that passes understanding. Lord, save me, please. Please save me. You're here today as a Christian and you say, Pastor King, 
my life hasn't always been everything it ought to be, and I'm here now, and I'm trying to go God's way, but I sure want to finish well. I'm one of those that has some regrettable things in my past, or I'm one of those that is especially susceptible to temptation, and I just want to stay faithful to Christ. I want to finish well. And I know I'm one of those that's going to need extra help, and I'm asking for it today. Would you just slip your hand up? I know I'm one of those that's going to need extra help. Lord, please help me. God bless you. My hand's all over the auditorium today. God bless you. Thank you for your honesty. God bless you. God bless you. And then finally you're here today and you say, Pastor King, so far so good and as far as I know my heart is right and my service is good and, but I'm facing an obstacle, a difficulty, a challenge in my home, in my marriage, in my workplace. But I have a challenge right in front of me that would overwhelm me and I need special grace from God in my circumstance. Would you just slip your hand up? I have a very specific concern that would sure hurt me if God doesn't help. Thank you, thank you so much. Heavenly Father, you've seen the hands, you, you know the hearts. Lord, you know the needs and you know our uprisings and our down sittings. Lord, I do pray for those that need repentance and cleansing and forgiveness and victory that you'd work in their heart. Help them walk in the light of the living. Help them walk with a pure heart. Help them put their head on a pillow with no dread and no regret day after day after day. Give them victory over that sin that plagues them. The ones that are here that perhaps are not saved, I pray you'd help them get that settled before they're too late, even today. Help them talk to a mom and dad. Help them talk to one of the pastors. But Lord, I pray you'd help them to not put their head on a pillow tonight until they've come to the foot of the cross and trusted only you. And then, Lord, I do pray for those that are facing a specific challenge. I don't know. But it's often very common for a Christian to be overwhelmed, swallowed up in grief, in guilt, in bitterness. Lord, you've seen these hands. I don't know what's going on in their heart and life, but you do, and you love them. And you said, my grace is sufficient and my strength is made perfect in weakness. And Lord, you delight in showing yourself mighty on behalf of them that love you. Would you bear your mighty arm on their behalf today? God, we wait upon you. We claim your promise. And now while heads are bowed and eyes are closed, I'm going to ask if you would just quietly stand to your feet all over the house. Everyone standing, heads bowed and eyes closed. And I'm going to ask someone to begin to play the instrument. And before we sing, if you're one of those that would like to take a moment and find a way at the altar and just say, God, please... Help me finish well. I want to stay true to you. I want to stay faithful to you. Maybe you made that decision a week ago. Wonderful. Maybe you're one of those that senses a drifting or a discouragement or a bewilderment. You'd like to just take a moment and say, God, please help me. Find a place at the altar. Maybe there where you're standing. If you're one of those that's outside of Christ and has never been saved and you know clearly you want to get it settled, come to the front. 
take the pastor's hand and say, hey, I want to get this settled. I'm not saved, but I sure want to be. Get it settled today. They can help you. God will save. Get it settled before it's too late. Maybe you're here today and you say, Pastor King, I'm afraid if anybody knew the truth about what I'm going through, they wouldn't like me very well. I'm not sure how everybody else would respond. Listen, listen. This is a hospital for sinners, not a showcase for saints. This is where you do business with God Almighty. Lord, help me stay true to you. I know I'm going to answer to you someday. I know hell waits for lost. I know the love of Christ. You've been wonderful in giving me a new life. I have a purpose. Help me live out what I believe.